So welcome, welcome to the Science Cafe. Uh, tonight, uh, Roxanne Molly Bruni, who is in the uh, Vice President for Research Office, is going to give the announcements and introduce me, I guess. I'm giving up control, guys. Yeah, I had to wrestle control, I think is the way I'm gonna say it. Because there's a reason. A lot of times you see Dr. Sarah Wyatt up here and she is our MC. And I don't know if you know the history, but we're in our 10th year for the Science Cafe. And 10 years ago, well, I guess 11 years ago, we were sitting here at the front room with a colleague. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could get students, faculty, staff, and the community together to talk about science? Wouldn't that be fun? How are we going to do that? Sarah was the person who realized we could do this through Sigma Xi. She was the person who spearheaded the proposal. I was the person who went for the funding. Together, we've been doing this for a long time. I don't know if many of you realize, Sarah is a presidential research scholar. It is one of the highest honors that we bestow on faculty members at this university for their research. She has also won numerous teaching awards. So the reason why I stole the mic from her today is because she would never have told you anything that I just said. But I wanted you to know how special she was and how fortunate you are to have her as your speaker tonight. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, so tonight, I've been showing you pictures of plants, if you're paying attention. They all have a response to gravity. And tonight, we're going to talk about gravity. And we're going to do several different things. So you're going to hear about plants. You're going to hear about gravity. You're going to hear about gene expression, signaling, big data, and space flight. So we'll get this started. Um, let me kill my. I figure you guys might like something. <laughs> so this was the talk, and this will become apparent later exactly why we're doing Earth, Moon, Mars. Um, all right, let's go the right direction. There we go. So what I've worked on for years is gravity. I like signaling. I like thinking about signaling how messages are signaled. If I touch this plant, what happens next? It's going to respond eventually. Even plants respond to touch. They respond to gravity. All, everybody knows they respond to light. Everybody goes, oh yeah, light's causing that. Well, gravity causes much of the response in plants. The positioning of the different limbs, if you look at the trees outside and the different species, a lot of them you can tell what species they are basically by limb position, right? Those of you that actually know how to tell plants from each other, right? Um, and that's because of gravity, it's not because of light. Everybody thinks, oh, the plant senses light. Yes, it does, but its first sensing mechanism is gravity, it's fundamental. They evolved just like we did to deal with Earth's gravity. So one of the fundamental questions in plant biology that we still don't have an answer to is how plants respond to gravity. How do they do it? So if you look at this, we know a lot about stimulus perception. When I was a postdoc, I started work on a NASA grant at North Carolina State working on gravity. So we know about perception. Perception of gravity is, at least in some regard, about movement of rock-like structures. These are, in a plant, are starch grains. So there are big starch grains in specific cells. So if you take my jar and you pretend it's a cell, you have the rocks on the bottom. If the plant is laid on its side, then the starch grains move. This adds weight, and the plant knows that's the new bottom. And then it can bend. So the plant knows where the bottom is. And ultimately, it will signal oxen. Oxen is a plant hormone. You guys hear a lot about hormones. Well, oxen is a plant hormone 
and it will ultimately result in differential growth or bending. The idea behind this is pretty straightforward. If you have a plant cell, it grows by expansion, elongation. Water flows in and the cell gets bigger. Well, if the cells get bigger on one side and not the other, the plant bends. It's really that straightforward. Cells on one side of the stem, the lower side of the stem, expand and the shoot bends, okay? Now you guys gotta remember all this because there's a test later, all right, really. Um, it's important to kind of keep this in your head and I'll come back to it as we go. So those are the two basic pieces right now that we know. That we, honestly, that's what we knew then, that's what we know now, pretty much. So starch grains, the starch statolith theory, goes to differential transport of oxen on the upper and lower sides of the stem or the root, goes to differential growth, which results in curvature and bending. Like all those plants that I was showing you before that are bending. Many of them are from my yard. Apparently my yard thinks it's a great place to have gravity experiments. They fall over, they bend up, they fall over. It's like, I don't know. I cannot grow a straight plant for my, my entire life. So, now, the issue was these early events. Nobody knows what they are. We are talking about a biophysical stimulus, right? Movement of these statilists to a biochemical result. So how do we get from biophysical to biochemical? So when I was a postdoc, I drew this figure, and we had this nice black box. It's been a few years since I was a postdoc, just an FYI. I'll let you guys read that. This is my favorite quote of all. It hangs above my desk in my office. I think you should be more explicit in step two. That's pretty much the state of things. And then about, oh, 20 or so years later, in 2013, I published what we call the gray cloud method, or the gray cloud model. So this idea of we had a black box, over the years, my lab and many other labs across the world have been working on signaling trying to figure out signaling. And we have all of these components that we believe are involved. There's scientific evidence for it, but we still don't know how that signaling mechanism occurs. So I called it a gray cloud. They're all in there, we just don't know how it works yet. And this is what I've spent most of my career trying to straighten out. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. There's gravity. Newton figured this out, but again, this is on Earth, right? This is on Earth. The first opportunity we had to go to space, some of you have heard me talk about this, probably many have not, was called Brick 20. That was the first space flight. Why did we go to space? Anybody know why we want to go to space? Why I wanted to? I always talk about me going to space. Obviously, I didn't get to go. Not that I wouldn't if they let me. So my plants, we, this is my lab, many of them, and a few more over there. Most of them are in space flight some things, shirts, something, um, and they can talk to you about some of this. You're gonna see many of them are involved in this research. So why would I go to space? Anybody? It's cool, all right, there's the cool answer. You're absolutely correct, it's cool. <laughs> Is it to see how plants react in zero gravity? To see how plants react in zero gravity. When you do an experiment, you need a control. If you wanna see how light works, you need something where the plant's not in light, right? The ultimate control, here's light, here's no light. Here's cold, here's warm, right? So you need a control. On Earth, we don't have a control for gravity. There is no gravity-free zone on Earth. Most of the experiments we do on Earth are about reorientation. I take a plant this way, I put it on its side, and then I see how it responds to that differential gravity vector, right? I move the gravity on it, basically. We do the same thing with seedlings. There's little tiny seedlings in here. 
You guys want to pass out some seedlings so guys can see the seedlings? So we can take these, you see the black line, I'm sure, right? You can see the black line? That's just to tell us they're, they're all planted right across the black line, and then we turn them on their side. And again, we look at what happens. So here is our really fancy way of turning them on their side. These are 3D printed little holders. So here the plants are planted straight across, and then we just flip them on their side. Now they're on their side. So gravity is hitting them from a different angle, right? We took this and we turned it on its side. And we looked to see what's different, but that's still not gravity. Even if we figure out everything that's going on, we still don't know what would happen in the absence of gravity. So thus our first space flight, you can see Here's some of the students. Most of these are people at Kennedy. It takes a lot of people to fly an experiment. This particular experiment, we set this one up ourselves at the International Space Station, or the International Space Station Processing Facility. And they were contained in these small um, units called uh, PDFUs. This is what I want. These particular, this particular piece of hardware uses 60 millimeter plates, much smaller plates than the ones that I'm passing around. So our experiment, when we proposed this to NASA, we had to be able to use 60 millimeter plates. We also, if you can see this, I don't know how much you can see, these aren't green, these are white. Why are they white? I'm trying to give you guys a chance to get some t-shirts. Come on, guys. I know how this, no light, absolutely no light. So you put this, these are Arabidopsis seeds. You put them into the container. You put the lid on the container. There's no light at all. And then they go to space. So they truly have no light response. It's all gravity. You guys want to pass a few of these around? Let people see them. These are actually from one of our failed experiments. And when I mean failed experiments, the launch didn't go off. So they said, do you want them back? Do you want us to trash them? And I was so emotionally attached to these guys. By the time I got them loaded into the stuff, it's like, well, you, you, you can't just throw them in the trash. So we brought them home, and they um, germinated. Somebody take some, send them somewhere. Um, quite literally, I could not throw them away. So we let them germinate in the dark, and now I have plates to pass around that are actually three years old, almost four years old now. So here's my big question. How many people does it take to take that plate and put it into that piece of hardware? Three. Three. Now, anybody else? Four. There you go. This is me, everybody else, so my collaborators, it takes this many people. Some of it is just, this is NASA, that checklist. Everything needs a checklist. You know, did you put this part in it? Did you build this? Did you get this done right? Whoops. So you can see here, part of it is assembling the unit. There's like 47 different pieces that go into that one little unit. Engineering is something NASA does really well. <laughs> Engineering. So that's, again, this is me, different glasses. And all I'm doing is taking the Petri dish, unwrapping it, and handing it to the other person. Four hours. Yeah. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. <laughs> all right, so there's the first one. We've got one built. Three, five. So there are five of these in what we refer to as the brick. If you remember the name of the project, it's called Brick 20. These are quite literally, you can see the hands here, they're quite literally about the size of a brick. So they're loaded inside, you put the lid on, screw it all down. Now one of the great things about a brick is it takes very little astronaut time. 
So again, think about this. You're setting up an experiment. You're going to propose to do an experiment with NASA. And they send out the call. And the first thing they tell you is you're going to use the brick hardware. So you've got to think of an experiment that you can do in this that is actually scientifically valid. The cool factor, all about that, but everybody would fly something if it was just cool. So something that's scientifically valid that's going to give us some real information in the dark, plants usually don't like the dark, right? So these are on media. They're on um, agar that has gro um, sugar and various growth food, basically. So they can eat, all right? Somebody, we were talking about this the other day, the variegated mutants. Have you guys seen, like, the white mutants where you have an albino? They come in plants, too. Usually albino plants don't last very long. Because, of course, plants need chlorophyll to make food for themselves. But you can feed a plant. So even the albino plants can live if you feed them. But I digress. So here are the bricks. They're ready to go. We had four of them, so we had 22 of these plates. There's actually four additional bricks. So we have exact complement of these that stay on Earth, and there's a special chamber at Kennedy Space Station, or at Kennedy, that they download the information from ISS. It's downlink, the environmental information. It's on a two-day delay, and they simulate exactly the environmental conditions that are on the space station at the time. Temperature, Temperature humidity, everything. That's one thing you get. You get a lot of data back. We have like temperature data for like every like 20 minutes for four days. Yes, Stefan? No, they do not see the launch at all. But you notice I'm sending up seeds that have not germinated. So technically the plants have never seen gravity and they have not experienced the launch. That's one of the things with a lot of the animal experiments, like the mice experiments. They're actually adult mice, and they experience launch, which is additional G, if you can imagine sitting on top of that rocket, right? Um, so the plants, we usually send up plants in seed. So they're dormant seed. These were cold. They were stowed in a coal bag. So they've seen no light. They haven't experienced gravity. At least the seedling hasn't. Um, and then we take them out. So we take them out. They're still in a coal bag. The rocket's on its side so that they can load them into the um, Dragon capsule at the end, and then they stand the rocket up. This was back in the day when you could still just drive, like, right out. This isn't a long-range lens. This is my phone. We got close, really close. Um, so off to see the launch just because we can be dramatic. So, it's for something in the morning. We're in the car. This is the first selfie I ever took in my life. Now we're out on the causeway. We're, we're playing music, this music, Rocket Man, anything we can think of that has a space theme. We're watching ISS. I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not. It is. ISS was coming overhead. You know, as you know, you can see it, right, at night. It's the third brightest object in the sky, right? There's an app for that if you want to know when it's coming over. And it just so happened that I knew it was coming over. So we're standing on, on the causeway. The launch is over there. And ISS coming overhead. I mean, talk about the perfect moment in your life. There's space music going, ISS is going overhead, and they're going to launch right to it. It's like, this is so cool. There's our view. I hear my colleagues say, um, it's 429, and my first thought is, um, what's the launch window? Then I got my phone buzzed in my pocket. I have a handler, or had a handler. She still exists, but she's no longer my handler. 
So they put somebody at NASA in charge of us because we're biologists and none of the engineers can talk to us, so we have a translator, basically, that you know, is in charge. Literally, it's hysterical. You know, I'm not allowed to talk to the engineers. They ask her questions, she asks me questions, this kind of thing. So I pull out my phone, and you know how that text shows that first little line? It's from her, the text is from her, and it's a frowny face. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, this isn't good. It's not even 5 a.m. in the morning, it's still not light, and we've got a van full of disappointed people going, I don't know, are they gonna launch? We don't even know what's wrong with it yet. She saw it on TV, she was in Orlando and saw it on TV and they actually called the, so we're all standing around going, really, really? So that was launch one. So persistence, this is like the, I don't know, 14th launch, no, it was probably 10. I actually, my colleagues, this is stress ball. This is a NASA stress ball. I bought a bunch of these, I gave them to all my colleagues, all the students. On the back, I'll pass it around if you guys promise to give it back to me. On the back, there's every launch date crossed out. You gotta just keep trying. All experiments, but if you're gonna fly something, good job. So, do over. Whoops. Everybody that came here wants to see a launch, right? Come on. Maybe. Uh huh. You did. This is Colin Cruz, by the way, um, one of my students. Uh, just an announcement that didn't get made earlier today. Colin was with me at the annual Sigma Xi meeting in San Francisco two weeks ago, and he actually won first place in the graduate student poster presentation. It may be failing. There's another launch, at least. Oh, we can call up the video. So you guys are going to be disappointed too, apparently. All right. All right, so if the second one doesn't launch, we're going to call them up individually. So we launch, the Dragon capsule gets docked. Then the astronauts go in and unload the Dragon capsule. So they pull our experiment out, pull it out of the cold bag. Now it's at room temperature. So now the seedlings will germinate because they're at room temperature. That was the entire trigger. That was it. Just pull them out. Let them be at room temperature. And then three days later, one of the astronauts, this is the most that the astronauts had to do with our stuff, is actually injecting a fixative into the seedlings to fix them before they return home. And they're put into the minus 80 freezer. Yes, the International Space Station has a minus 80 freezer. It's amazing some of the things that they've created to support research on the International Space, Space Station. Then it came home. Um, I remember the day it came home really well. It was a rogue snowstorm in the middle of February. We had beautiful weather. They said, okay, it's coming. This is on a big truck, it's coming. And this huge snowstorm hit. And they were an hour, they called me from I don't know, like West Virginia said, you know, we're on our way, it'll be 20 minutes, whatever it was. And this, then they, you know, an hour passed, another hour. They got caught in the snowstorm, right? Again, persistence. We will. So this is what they look like. So they literally froze the entire brick. So they're not taking anything out. They froze the entire thing. Well, then we had to get it apart. And what they normally do is thaw it but I wouldn't let them thaw it because I wanted to extract protein and I didn't want a freeze thaw cycle in it. So they had to figure out how to thaw it enough that they could actually get the screws out. 
without actually thawing the samples. And the upshot to that was we spent about four hours in a refrigerator, a cold room, with these frozen things going, can you get it yet? No. Can you get it yet? No. All right. So finally they come out, and here they are. And this, the lid, of course, is frozen to the thing, right? So then we have to wait until we can pry the lid off. I love these. They look like popsicles. This thing just kind of screws on the top to pull them out. And there's Colin again. Oh, these are out of order. So this is when it came back. So this is the truck and this is the snowstorm. And you can see the sticker. You're going to see another one of these. Critical space item. Who knew? So they get to us. So this is, and here they are. They come back frozen. And of course, at this point, they're frozen. We still don't know if the seedlings germinated or if anybody grew. Literally. So the guy from Kennedy's calling me. He's got, so have you got, you know, do you have growth? Do you have, because they're all freaked out that I'm not going to, you know, we're all a little freaked out. You know, you think the launch, oh, it launched. We're good. And then the minute it goes up, tell me I'm wrong, you go, oh, now it's got to come down. Is it going to grow? Oh, um, so you just trade one nauseous moment for the next. So we got the seedlings, we thawed them, and you can see them in here. They look sort of like the ones that I passed around. They're little white seedlings. And then we extracted. We extracted, so we had, let me back up, we had four different treatments. So we had the space flight treatment. We had the ground controls that were Kennedy in the special chamber. Then we had two control sets that we used here in Ohio. One for the fixative and one for, normally we would freeze things immediately in liquid nitrogen for RNA extraction. So we had another one with, with liquid nitrogen. So four different things. We did three different extractions. So we did RNA-seq, we did soluble proteins, we did membrane proteins. So we've got four different treatments. So you're starting to get a sense, right? Now, there's three replicates of each of these. It's getting bigger. And we got phosphorylation data back. No one to date has gotten phosphorylation data back at all. So we have all of these data sets that we can compare to each other, that we can look at gene expression, actually protein expression, because we all know genes. So we have RNA. There's DNA. It gets transcribed to RNA, right? Central dogma. But if you know a little bit more than just the fundamental, this is biology, DNA, RNA, protein, what you know is there's a lot of RNA that never makes it to protein. And protein's the functional part, right? Protein's what actually does the work. So the analysis. We found 819 transcripts. They were differentially expressed, 60 soluble proteins, 36 membrane proteins, 300 gigabit bytes, gigabases of data. So I told you there would be big data. The funny part is, this at the time, this looked huge, right? This looked like a whole lot of data. Now, this looks like nothing. But here's one of the analysis that we did. I know you can't read any of this, but this is a uh, gene ontology. So we annotate all the genes. And this is a heat map showing different clusters of genes, different processes that are either up or down regulated in space. All right, so those that are up regulated in space on this side, those that are down regulated in space or upregulated on Earth on this side. Um, and then we pulled out a few of them just so we could see. There's a set for you that you can kind of read. So heat shock proteins, um, outer envelope, translocal and inner membrane. These are chloroplast genes normally. That's what, that's what everybody knows them as. So if you look up their annotation, they come up, oh, it's a chloroplast. 
You guys remember what I called these? These are plastids. So these are a different type of plastid. So there's chloroplast, there's amyloplast, which are these, amylostarch. There are chromoplasts, which make the leaves all kinds of beautiful colors this time of year. So it may be that these genes are truly involved in plastid sedimentation or in signaling of plastids. We just don't have them annotated yet. This is one of the biggest uh, caveats in doing gene expression. We all run to see, oh, well, what, what, are they, what does it know? What do we know about this? The problem is the minute you say, what do we know about this? You sort of miss the point. We're experimenters, we're researchers, we're trying to find new knowledge. Yes, this is what we know, but this is only what we know about this gene. This may, gene may be working in other functions. Um, here's another one. This one had actually been um, annotated to, do, to have something to do with shoot gravitropism, uh, syntaxin. These are genes that have been discovered with gravitropism before. And then this one, which was a particularly interesting one. Look at these. Early light inducible. Early light inducible. High 5, which is a light regulated gene. Um, phytochrome, light, phyto plant, chromophores, phototropin. What did I tell you about these plants? Huh? They're not grown in the light. And yet we see this whole cadre of genes that are annotated as light, which would indicate there's got to be some crosstalk between the gravity signaling mechanisms and the light signaling mechanisms. We're not the first person to notice this. I mean, if you have your plants in the house and you have light on one side, obviously they kind of go this way, you notice that you can't make them go upside down. If you put a plant, this is dangerous, upside down, and you put a light source down here, the plant will still bend up. Why? Anybody got a guess? Come on, anybody got a thought? Why would a plant still bend up even though all the light source is at the bottom? Gravity. gravity. It relies on gravity. Plants rely on gravity. They know that the light should be up. And even if you give them a light, Gravity is stronger. That, that signaling, that mechanism is stronger than the light. No, it's true. Try it. I tell kids all the time, try the stuff at home. You know, now lay all your mother's house plants on their side. Okay, so you guys remember the gray cloud? Remember all these guys? We don't have genes. We have processes, most of them. With this experiment, we were ab able to hypothesize. These aren't confirmed. These are hypotheses. But these are genes that are involved in these different processes. So for the first time, we actually have some genes that might be responsible for these different pieces. Also, this one. Does anybody remember that one? Wasn't in the first part, diagram, so I'll leave it till back. See this one? There's no NO in there. This is nitric oxide signaling. So we have some good evidence that nitric oxide is being used in the signaling pathway as well. Again, it doesn't give us a pathway yet, but it gives us some genes that we can look at for these different pathways. Does that make sense? This is one of my favorites. Personally, one of my favorites. This is right here. This is an ATPA, and the little P beside it says it's differentially phosphorylated. It doesn't show up differential expression, only that it's phosphorylated on Earth, but not in space. What does phosphorylation mean? Anybody? Why would, it, why would we care whether something's phosphorylated or not? Somebody's muttering over here. Anybody? Phosphorylation is like a light switch. A lot of the proteins in your body are there. 
they're there, they're ready to go anytime you need them, but you don't always need them. So your body needs to turn them off and then to be able to turn them on when you do need them. Phosphorylation is one of the mechanisms that plants and animals use to turn genes on and off. So that's aha. So in space, it's inactive. There's no phosphorylation. On Earth, it's more often phosphorylated. And what it does is it pushes protons. Remember, protons were on that model. Protons lead to elongation. Remember my model here? You have to have some way of getting the water to go in, right? So you're going to elongate these cells based on water flooding into the system, okay? That can be controlled by protons. These are all just hypotheses. They're places for us to go, places for us to think about. And one of the undergrads, Ava, who's sitting right there, um, is working on this. She's going to uh, take the gene for AHA and knock out the phosphorylation site so that we can look at plants with and without the phosphorylation possibility to see if phosphorylation really is regulating gravity signaling. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about brick and some of that stuff? Because I'm going to tell you about something that's even cooler. The plants, the plants were, the experiment lasted three days, but the plants were up there about a month because most of that time they spent in the freezer because when you fly, you know, they launch the rocket, the Dragon capsule is a resupply mission, really. So it docks with the space station, they unload everything, then they load it back up with whatever they're sending back home and then it leaves about a month later. So we were actually, we came home on the same flight we went up on that one. So that month was while we were up. And just an FYI, I told you guys that uh, you can see the space station. The entire time that experiment was on the space station, it was quintessential January here, which means cloudy. No hope. The space station went over a couple times, and I stood out in the yard looking at the clouds. <laughs> but that's okay. I did see this one while it was on orbit. Yes? No. If you get funded, so the question is if you get funded for an experiment and the launch fails, do you have to apply again? No. They owe you a ride. Now, you may have to reset up your experiment, which is what we did. So we had, I know it's terrible sounding, but I had to go to Kennedy 10 times during fall semester into the winter in January. What a shame. <laughs> so I will admit the first time I went to Kennedy in July wasn't the best place to be, but it was beautiful in January. So yes, they will let you fly again. Um, so this is our latest experiment. There's Al. Al's in charge of this one. And this is called PGP, which is sort of what I named this for. My colleague at Ohio Wesleyan actually designed this experiment, and he usurped everybody's favorite phrase, plant gravity perceptions, like, why do you get it? So this experiment's called PGP. And this is where we get to Earth, Moon, Earth, Mars, Moon, I guess, and ISS. And I'm going to explain that to you right now. So one of the really cool pieces of equipment, hardware, up on the space station is the European Module Cultivation System. So this is called EMCS. It only took me about a year to get the initials in the right order, but it's OK. This particular experiment, you see this round piece? It's a rotor. It's like a centrifuge. It spins. So we're taking plants. The plants are here, and they're along the rotor. 
So we have five cassettes here, and I'll show you these cassettes in a minute a little bit bigger. Five along here, and this is going to spin. We can spin it in space. Why would we want to spin a rotor in space? Artificial gravity. If you spin something, if you spin something, you generate a force. Now, depending on how far along this arm it is, gives you an idea of how much force. Of course, the other piece is, if you spin it faster, you generate more force. For some of you, you may have played a game, it was called Crack the Whip when I was a kid, where everybody stand, stood in a row and you know, one person is doing like this in the center. And as you move faster and faster and you spin everybody around, everybody on the outside in, we actually had a little kid on the outside and we could spin them. I mean, we could fly them, right? They'd hang on, they could fly until everybody fell apart. But yeah, to really hang on to each other. But that idea of, you know, you knew it then, right? I'm not doing anything. There's no force on me in the center, but at the end of this, there's a huge force. So the faster you spin it, the more force you get. So the idea of this experiment, for every single rotor, there are five different G levels. Now, they're not very far apart, so you don't generate much differential force. However, if you spin one a certain speed, you spin another a different speed, you can actually calculate the, the force. So we have this one, which is basically zero G, and you can see this first one here, the first spin, this is the center, is 0 0.0032 gravity. Pretty close to zero. And then we have a series of those, and then you see the second rotor coming in, and then the third. And one of the things you'll notice, this one is set pretty close to moon. Moon is one six Earth gravity. And if you move up a little further, you get 0.34. Mars is one third Earth gravity. And then if you spin it a little harder, you can actually generate 1G. So we can actually look at these little seedlings at different G levels. Now the idea here, the first idea was, I turn these seedlings on their side. Did we send these? We did not. So I turn these seedlings on their side. At 1G, they bend. We know that in microgravity, zero on the ISS, they don't really bend. But how much gravity is enough gravity to make them bend, to make them responsive? If we want to grow, grow things on Mars, or we want to, we, there's been a lot of talk about establishing a moon colony. If we want to grow things on the moon. Is there enough gravity for germination, for correct orientation and growth? And of course, my real interest is really about that fundamental science, science of can we figure out what genes are involved and can we use this sort of stair-step approach to get us more information on genes that are regulated up and down? So that's the Earth, Moon, Mars part. This is the cassette. So you saw the five pieces. This is the cassette. What you've got here is about 15 seeds all planted pretty closely to a single row. You can see the hand in that one gives you an idea. These cassettes are about this big. You want to... These are the membranes and there's some seeds plated on these membranes. I'll let you guys pass those around. So you can see what we're dealing with. So th there's not a lot of growth on this. You know, there's not a lot of room for things to grow. So here you see the five lined up. You'll also know that this hardware provides light. So we can actually have light on this experiment. And we actually use light to, set, to start off unidirectional light, light from one side, to get the seedlings kind of straightened out for us so we can tell when they bend because if we just let them grow with no gravity, they're going to go every which way, and then we're not going to be able to tell anything. This is a good sign. It's 10, 9, 8, 
So this one was set up at Ames in California. The experiment was set up there, and it's what's called a long delay. So there it goes. So we could set it up a month or two in advance, and then they loaded it on the rocket. We still went down to see the launch you saw at the beginning. Now this particular one, this is one of the first times that they actually brought this first stage back down and landed it. So we not only got to see it launch, we got to see the engineering feat of it coming back down and parking. And I'll keep talking and you can watch it and eventually somebody will go, ah, there, yeah. So we'll see it come down. So we got to see it launch and then everybody's attention was like, hey, where's it gonna come down now, right? So this is the and same rocket. This is a model of that rocket. Um, uh, for Brick 20, we actually launched this rocket here on, on time. at OU. Uh, a few seconds after that, it cleared the towers and then uh, did the pitch kick maneuver. Um, currently, vehicle is supersonic. And there's the Dragon Capsule. We're able to make out a small uh, sonic boom there. Uh, we're about to head to max Q, which is maximum aerodynamic pressure. That's the point at which the rocket is pushing hardest against the atmosphere. So this ex experiment as well, it went up with dry seeds. Just finished that uh, stage of flight. So again, we're flying dry seeds that, so we don't have the seedlings. Started. MVAC engine chill gets the uh, engines cold enough uh, just in the way that the first stage engines perform its chill. And then we water we them. Shortly, we're gonna have so that few, hardware allows for us uh, to water them. This hardware takes quite a bit more astronaut time because it goes uh, up in these little cassettes separate. and then they have to load the, the cassettes onto the, the rotors. Is then going to make its way back and then to they have to spin each one. experiment uh, separately. Back. We're still launching. See if I can push it forward. Maybe, maybe not. Where we go? I tell you what, we'll come back to this. Because it takes a few minutes once it launches and comes back. So here's the hardware up. So they've loaded it. There's actually two rotors, one above the other. And that round disc with all the seedlings in it gets placed in the rotor. And then they run the rotor. You can see the seedlings. So these are seedlings. They started growing this way, so they were given light. And then the rotors were turned on, and they started bending, some of them, depending on what level of G, what G level. So we actually have, or at least my colleague at Wesleyan, actually has video images of every single seedling and whether it bent or it didn't bend, whether it was a responder or not whether they grew. This is a great part about this. Remember the other one? We brought it back down and we didn't know if they'd grown or not. This one, you just have to hold your breath long enough to see the videos. So these videos were sent to him almost immediately on a downlink, and he could watch them grow as they were growing. Um, and he could watch the different treatments and see where they are. Now he has all of that data at Wesleyan that he's going through to help inform us as to which ones, which actual seedlings we want to extract. So this is astronaut, I'll give you a little bit. This is one of my favorite videos simply because you see him, he's taking apart the rotor, so he's gonna put them in the freezing bags, the cold bags, and then he sneezes. Every time that happens, Al goes, because he's going to extract RNA out of these. Now, obviously, they're all in a sealed little container, and it really doesn't matter, but he's got, like, no gloves on, and, yeah. A little nerve-wracking. So it came back, too. It came back in a much smaller truck, and there wasn't a snowstorm. 
So the guy, that's the driver of the truck, he had no idea what he had. He said, yeah, he said, you guys drill. And I said, and I wouldn't let him take it out of the van. We stood here like this because Colin and Al were both, we didn't know where he was coming. They came running back down, so they wanted to be there. I was like, no, you can't get out of the truck. You're just going to have to wait. You see again. So, and then the coolest container I've ever seen. Talk about an engineering feat of brilliance. This is a cryo shipper. There is no, it's based on liquid nitrogen, but there's no actual liquid in it. What they do is they pour it full of liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen absorbs into the side panels, the foam sort of inserts, and they just keep filling it up until it won't take anymore. Then they dump out all the liquids and they put your samples in. So you can see it degassing, right? And obviously this is the packet that they send back. So all five of them are in one packet and they're going into R minus 80. And that's pretty much where that is. We're still waiting to analyze the data. We have some uh, pilot experiment data that we have. Uh, but this one, what's the number of extractions? So there's a couple of hundred extractions, if you can imagine that. I passed around that first set of plates and the seedlings were really small. That's the size seedling that he's dealing with. Really tiny seedlings. You remember these cassettes are really small, right? So the seedlings only get about this big and we're dissecting them into, when I say we, I mean him, right? So you guys know anytime I say we, I mean the students. Um, all I do is write grants and take photographs, I swear. Um, so they t he's taking that little bitty tiny seedling and he's dissecting it into the root tip, the rest of the root, the hypocotyl, the shoot, and then the cotyledons themselves. So for every one of those, there's four different extractions. All right? And with that, I'm going to leave you with my favorite quote of all. From all I need to know, I learned in kindergarten. Remember the seed in the styrofoam cup. The roots go down and the shoot, go, the plant goes up, and nobody really knows how or why. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. If you guys have questions, happy to talk a little bit more. Oh, we missed this video somehow. This is them injecting water into the seedlings and starting the experiment. You can see them fill with water. The other thing you should notice here is, all right, in a minute you'll see it, it's spinning. You see this up here moving? In a minute you'll see it really well. There's the other rotor with the, so the camera is actually focused. So there's an individual camera focused on each one of these pieces. So each set of cassettes. And so both of those are actually spinning and you can tell that up here. So this is video that's downlinked from ISS. Sure, you can pull up the landing directly. So we'll show you guys the landing. Questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, are there any effects from the foliage or the forces on the centrifuge that would make it grow not quite like it would under gravity? Well, that's why there is a unit on Earth. So it's not a perfect model, obviously, but it is the only place that we can actually give okay, a gravity-like force on ISS. So usually what we do is we set up those ground controls like we did in our first experiment. The ground controls are on Earth. They don't experience the launch. They don't experience the radiation and all the other things that are experienced on flight. So this, the EMCS actually allows us to send the control experiment up there as well. And it's spinning or not spinning. So you can hold one of the rotors totally still while the other one spins so you have your kind of best control possible, but no, there's no guarantee that it's exactly the, the same. Anybody else? Yes. I thought of touching about it is in, you use a different location speed to mimic the different G force. Yes. Right? I'm curious, could 
because uh, these balls, different G balls, they have different speed. Will the speed cause, I don't know, where the speed No, I mean the speed is generating a force. Yes. So the plant it's is. It determines the, radi the radius. Yeah, it determines the, the, the length, length of the arm, right? determines the amount right. of g gravity. Some Well, you can do that. You can increase the radius as long as you're not on the space yeah. station. Yeah. On the space station, you got X amount of space. So, yeah. I mean, so, yes. So you could also do the experiment. You could use a rotor arm that was the size of this room. You can use, I mean, you could do that. But again, that limitation of what can we do on the space station? Yeah, I'm so trying to relate to my, you know, of animal students, because we have brain. We have the same G-force. If you, the radius, the farther you talk about feel not, will or not feel dizzy with the same G-force. But like getting shorter, the speed is getting faster, you will feel dizzy by the way. I'm I don't to think, think about whether plants also have some type of dizziness. Oh, I don't disagree with you. I mean, if you want dizzy plants, I got them right here. For those of you that have been watching this go round and round, this is a clinostat. It's one of the ways that we, quote, simulate microgravity. Does anybody in this room think these aren't experienced gravity? Don't raise your hand. Okay, so the idea here is, the idea of this one, remember our statilus? If I slowly rotate them, what happens? The plant knows it's on its side, or it knows that the statilus are here, but it can never figure out where here is because it's constantly being stimulated all the way around. Now, this is an experiment that's used quite often to simulate microgravity because... We just saw it. Oh, you saw it. All right, so I'm going to let him replay that, and I'm going to shut up for a minute and let, him, let you guys watch it. So that idea of, yeah, these are dizzy. I, you know, these plants are just dizzy. Um, Sarah, I don't understand the magnitude of the forces involved here. Because the biochemistry that you're talking about with these genes and so on is a, an electrostatic force, which is mm -hmm. millions and millions of times larger than gravity. How on earth can you run a, a chemistry experiment, a biochemistry experiment, and hope to see any effect on the protons, let's say, proton transfer from a force that is so weak? compared to the electrostatics involved? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> it was a long question. So the idea is biochemistry, the forces are so much greater than the gravity forces. How can you possibly me measure the small forces? The reality is we can. Plants are that sensitive. You know, we're looking at gene expression. We are looking at some phosphorylation. But the other thing that you have to realize is, look, plants were up there for the first experiment for three days. So we're not looking at brief time periods. So they've been up there. So this is something that has had three days to occur. So there's, we certainly have evidence that it can occur. Now, figuring out exactly how that chemistry works is a whole other ball game. And there are groups of chemists looking at molecular uh, reconstitution, molecular experiments, looking at, you know, we know that crystals, crystallography, so for um, crystallography experiments, crystals go better in space. Without the force of gravity, we get better crystals. There's a lot of things, this, that's the, one of the cool things still about space and no gravity. There's a lot of things we don't understand and we're sort of working our way backwards from the sort of big biology things because you can't see many things. There's so many problems with and restraints on the experimental design that you kind of start with the big pieces. I mean, it's sort of amazing that we can manage to have video images of the plants growing and get to see those things at different G levels. Um, even more ama amazing is how little gravity a plant needs in order to make a decision to go one way or another. Um, so that was kind of surprising. One of the other things that we have on that, that flight is a mutant that has no starch, so it doesn't make satellites. So we have both that mutant and we have wild type, and we get to see how the different ones respond differently 
to those artificial G levels, if you will. I mean, there's centrifugal forces, they're not really G. I, I would expect then, your, all your examples with zero gravity, the growth was absolutely random. Yes, the growth is absolutely random. In that first series that I showed you before I started talking, there was, uh, can, they were canisters and they had plants in them. And if you look at that, what you see is the hypocotyls and the roots are completely intertwined. What we've learned, you know, one of the very first questions in spaceflight was, will, plant, will seeds even germinate? Will a plant even know what to do if it doesn't have gravity to direct it? And what we found was, yeah, they germinate. They have no idea which way to go. But we can direct them. If we give them light, they will grow more or less towards light. It's not as straight, but they will grow towards light, and water will bring the roots down. So you can get them sort of elongated out, which was sort of what we did um, in the last experiment where we gave them light from one side so that they would sort of straighten out enough that once we applied the force, we could see if they would bend. Well, yes? At more gravity, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting experiment. It's actually one that hasn't been done that much. There's one lab that has these really large centrifuges. If you think about it, you know, we have centrifuges in the lab, but they go way too fast to do a kind of a plant experiment. You have no light, no, you know, there's huge problems with that. There is a facility in Europe where they've actually designed these, and NASA has some of these rotors. You used to see like a human sitting on the end of this really long arm and they would spin them, right? Um, so there have been some facilities to look at that and that's actually one of the things that we've proposed in, to add to the second experiment, the PGP, is to go to Europe and use those and not only will we have fractional G, but we'll also have hyper G moving up in two or three different levels. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yeah, the dizziness concept, the, the clinostats. They don't have any clue which way to go. Now, if you look at the genes that are being expressed, what you find is the plant is under huge stress. So there's been a lot of discussion about, well, this is a huge stress response. So the plant knows something's happening. It just doesn't know what, which way to go. So that idea of we can look at the genes, and one of the things that we're doing with several experiments um, is trying to compare how well this actually simulates flight, because there are very few flight experiments a year. Very few, very few plant ones, because you have to kind of divide up. ISS is a research lab, but there's a lot more researchers out there than just plant people. Are we done? I'm doing her job. She usually stands here and warns them to get closer. I was just going to ask you to do the... Oh, so the uh, next cafe is Julie Soor, a professor in psychology on detecting deception. And then the first cafe after the break, after the holiday break, is January 23rd, and that's Doug Klo, an associate professor of physics and astronomy. Um, I'm happy to stay up here. You're welcome to come up and talk to me and see some of this stuff. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments. <laughs>